So I just had a meh, pretty darn scary slash weird dream, all right? I woke up like 30 plus minutes ago and in my dream, I heard tapping on the window, all right? And you know when you hear it and know that it didn't come from the dream? In fact, it makes you realize you're dreaming. Like when you're asleep and you can hear your alarm in that dream while you're sleeping. Yeah. So later on, after I basically wa watched my ass possibly die on a YouTube video in the dream, I woke up and right when I woke up, there were tapping sounds on my muffin flipping window. All right, it could be a squirrel. It could be a creepy old man. It could be a really strong ant. I don't know, man. But I like to keep things light when I get freaked out. This is for anyone who has ever lived in a haunted house or was haunted. I have one question. Should I purposely watch Elmo, Teletubbies, Spongebob or Barney and pretend out loud that those voices are the scariest voices in the world? Because so far, they mimicked people I spoke to on Peepaphone. Do you think instead of mimicking my family, friends, a little girl or little boy or woman's voice, they would start mimicking fucking Elmo and telling me to let me it, help me? Or maybe in like the voice of Barney, it says, I will kill you. Or like it's usual super evil laugh it makes, but in Elmo's voice. I mean, the one with the deeper raspy voice doesn't really mimic voices, but the two kids do. Also, if I capture more shadows on my phone, should I try to make a TikTok dance video with them? Asking for a friend. Anyway, thanks for coming to my TED talk. And this is an open discussion because this is the fifth or sixth haunted place I've lived in. And I'm just going to see how this one goes. Because honestly, I've lived in so many. And I think the dream was in direct reference to me filming my experience this time. And so far, whatever these things are, don't like that. Honestly, I'm not a skeptic. I live in a haunted house run. I've had way too many experiences in my life to be skeptical. But I mean, there comes a time when you keep getting into haunted buildings by accident. And they all try to do is keep you in fear. And when I get scared, I don't know about anyone else. But I start being funny in my own thoughts, kind of overlapping whatever they're doing so I could keep a level head. It keeps me calm. Growing up in so many haunted houses, I know fear is their greatest weapon. That and jump scares out of the corner of your eyeballs. It's like they don't know if they want the credit or not. I mean, I should just start walking around the house with that stuff horses wear on their head to keep them looking straight. Also, with the lights turning off and loud noises... It's literally like I'm living with a super scary toddler who's tall enough to turn off the lights and stuff. Like an Adam's family toddler. That's what it's like to live in a haunted house. You know that scene from The Shining when the elevator doors open and the hallway is flooded? Like, I need that. But like all of it in holy water. My boyfriend had just gone to the military about a month ago. We received a mandatory military order letter in the mail. Before he left, he bought me a couple rings and he has one as well. We've been together for six or seven years and are really close and it's just a great relationship. He loves me a lot. We both wear these rings, except for recently when I was unable to find it. I always put it in the same spot, but it was gone. My boyfriend messaged me today and said he had a dream and he thought it was important to tell me. I hadn't yet really told him about much of anything that was going on in the house. He and I usually don't share our dreams with each other, so I listened. His dream. My boyfriend was hanging out with his friend. His friend is a pretty bad friend of ours who we both dislike. But we are friends with him anyway, because the guy doesn't have many friends. As they were hanging out, his friend handed my boyfriend a bag of black powder. When my boyfriend refused, he put the bag into my boyfriend's pocket. My boyfriend looked up at his friend and his friend had no face. Cue my post, The Apartment and Possession, where I had seen myself without a face. Not a dream that time. Then my boyfriend's mom's car showed up. She was going to pick them up. As he was in the car, my boyfriend threw the bag of black powder out the window. Then he looked down and saw a wooden cross necklace. My boyfriend didn't know I lost my wooden cross necklace recently, somewhere in the house. He said it looked like mine and that it came out of nowhere. Then the car pulled up to his house. 
He walked inside and his friend and a few other people were sitting on the sofa in the living room. All of them were laughing and talking. His friend still has no face. The friend looked up at my boyfriend and asked for a favour. My boyfriend said, no, you're just using me. The friend walked up to my boyfriend and placed another bag of black powder into his hands. My boyfriend refused and the friend's demeanour suddenly changed. He was upset and took out a ring box. The friend opens the ring box and inside of it is my ring, the one I recently couldn't find. My boyfriend asked him, how did you get that? The friend said, maybe I should just get rid of it and cancel this ring. My boyfriend goes quiet and then notices that in order to get the ring, this thing would have had to have been in my house. He asks, what are you going to do to my girlfriend? The no-faced friend moves his head up as if to look my boyfriend in the eyes. A smile formed on its face and he said it started to laugh, that it was the most evil and deep laugh, something that sticks in his mind and is hard to forget. He said that it was very evil, not only the laugh, but whatever it was. He woke up and immediately told me of the dream. He said for some reason, he felt that he had to tell me about it and that we both have to be careful this time. So a little bit ago, I was having issues in the house. I rented a room in the house and when everyone else moved out, I was the last one there. Recently, I had gotten two new roommates, but they moved out in the middle of the night. Then almost as soon as they left, I had gotten two different roommates. I have some EVPs and videos of the things I caught. No images of what they are, nothing caught on tape that was an image, just EVPs. Many people could hear them and my door handle moving. I just got a new door handle on my door, so there wasn't much reason for it to be making noise, or shaking, or unlocking on its own. As time went on, I decided to pray, and that seemed to really calm things down. In fact, it seemed to simply go away. But today, I was taking a shower, where I had caught the most EVPs. Before I went to take a shower, I heard a little boy's voice. Not a little girl like before, but I felt like it was similar to whatever she was. It said, Caitlin, you are my mama. Fucking weird. I instantly remembered an EVP I had taken earlier of a girl's voice saying mama in that bathroom. I went in and turned the water on and well, I was taking a shower. What more could be said? While I was in there, I kept hearing a little boy and a little girl telling me to come here. I figured it was just the water from the shower, I guess, and the white noise from it. So I kept scrubbing up dubbing. Then I heard my own voice crystal clear and it kept saying, Caitlin, and Caitlin, come here. I rinsed and then squealed the shower handle to close the water. Still thinking of forcing myself to believe it was just the white noise from the water. Then I heard it again from the other side of the shower room. I listened more closely and I heard my voice again. It sounded like it came from the cabinet, underneath my sink. Well, I dried off and pretended like I didn't hear anything at all. I don't want to believe it's back, so I simply, well, will proceed to keep ignoring it. I had a friend back in elementary school. My sister and I used to be their only friends. Other kids bullied him because he was gay, but we didn't. We would chase them off and laugh with him, patting him on his back. We never brought it up, but we knew though, that we were the only friends he had. My sister and I used to go to his house. His mom would bake a batch of cookies every single time. I remember the smell, it was so delicious. My friend and I would either play in the backyard. He had a friend, Chipmunk, that he used to feed all the time. But for some reason, a reason I didn't yet understand, he hid his friendship with the chipmunk from his father. My sister and I would usually sew clothes in the basement with him. We would sew clothes for our stuffed animals. His grandpa built a beautiful dollhouse for him. It was in the basement and was gorgeous. He really loved that dollhouse. He had a younger brother who was always upstairs watching cartoons. I didn't know that he died a few years later. As time went on, my dad divorced my stepmom. We packed up and moved when the school year was over. We, 
we lost his phone number during the move, so we never spoke to him again. During the year of 2013, I was in my room playing a video game, when suddenly I saw a vivid dream while still awake. I saw that I was in a room, there was a small kind of party going on. I turned to the window and then to the couple of people in the room, their smiles for some reason had fainted and turned to unknowing fear or sadness. I slid backwards, my feet dragging on the ground. I was lifted onto a railing and then I saw a woman there. The word mom came to my mind. Then I dropped and before I hit the street, I simply snapped out of it. A day or so later, I was in my bedroom. My dad knocks on the door. He has a newspaper in his hands. I look at him, smiling and expecting to have a coffee with him and to listen to him about how his night at work went. My dad didn't smile this time. He slowly walked over to me. Later on, after this moment, my dad said that while at work, his co-workers were laughing and talking about the transgender kid who died downtown. They showed my dad the newspaper. He didn't laugh like they did. He didn't joke like they did. He looked at the newspaper. On the front page was my friend's face plastered upon it. My dad sat down beside me. Kate, do you remember your friend Nate? I smiled and said, yeah, dad, of course. He took a deep breath and I didn't understand yet why he was so odd today. He said, Nate just killed himself. I'm so sorry. He slowly handed me the newspaper. I saw my friend's face. He grew up so much, but now he went by another name. But it was her. It was my friend. I didn't know what to say. My dad said he jumped from the balcony. I started to tear up and I could hear my tears hitting the paper. My dad put his arm around me and hugged me. It was another moment in my life where I didn't save someone. So I've been having some issues in my house. I prayed in my room, even though I'm not very good at it. Got an EVP. After I said, I'm calling upon the Archangel Michael, I heard a growl with my own ears. Within the growl was the EVP. I actually didn't catch it. It was another person who did. The next night I confronted them. Basically, I stood in the living room at night. They seemed to be the most active at night. Something felt like it stood behind me put its icy hand on my shoulder and said my name right into my ear. I got pissed. Shout out a warning shot. Basically a burst of light. If you don't know what that is, people who are physics can do things once they learn how to do it. Other people wouldn't see it with their eyes. The icy feeling on my shoulder went away pretty quick. I asked, how many? A little girl's voice came from my right and said, many. I got pissed and said, how many again? A man's voice behind me said, seven. Another said, nine. A deeper voice mocking to my left said, many more. Ha. The room filled with whispers all around. I started walking back to my room and turned around expecting to see them, but nothing was there. As I kept walking down the hallway, the whispers came closer. I opened my door and looked back glaring at where the whispers were coming from, and I said in an intention, I will burn you. I said it in the same way I would do to a ghost, so I didn't say it out loud. The whispers stopped. I knew I was angry and I should know better. I needed help. I went into my bedroom, prayed five to seven times. A ton of neck pain, etc. I didn't take it seriously, the neck pain. It can be explained away. I went to sleep and the house felt lighter and brighter. It felt like finally they were gone, but I don't know. It felt like underneath it that maybe not. The sun went down around 8.20 to 8.30. It was 8.40 and the room started to feel heavier. Whispers again from behind the door. I was getting ready to pray again. I was kind of angry, upset, etc. Then it felt like my room was full of people. It was a good feeling this time. I felt a warm feeling. A woman's voice said, it's all right, we're here. Then the whispers behind the door had stopped. I still don't know exactly what's going on, but this room feels really, really good. My uncle was a very young child and he was sleeping in a bedroom on the second floor. 
He had woken up in the middle of the night and he remembered that he must have woken up because he was thirsty. The room was dark as was the hallway that passed his bedroom door which at the time was open so that he could call out to his aunt if he needed anything. As he laid there he called out Aunt Jane, Aunt Jane but no answer. It was at this time that he noticed his aunt walk past his bedroom door. She had a long white nightgown on and her skin seemed snow white and pale like it almost glows in moonlight. But he said she wasn't really walking. Her head didn't move as if she was walking. It was more like she was floating. Once she passed his bedroom door, he called out to her again. Aunt Jane, Aunt Jane, can I have a glass of water? It was silent. He had no idea if she heard him. Moments later, as he was watching his bedroom door to see if she would come inside, fingers crept around the top right edge of the door frame. He said, Aunt Jane? It was strange because the ceilings are so tall that if someone tried to peek inside the room at that height, they would have to have been seven or seven and a half foot tall. This was when he felt maybe this wasn't his Aunt Jane. Paralyzed in fear, he watched his eyes and then a face peeked from the top edge of the door frame. The face had no eyes. It only had pits for where the eyes should have been. Its face seemed sunken and dead. This thing that looked like an evil mirror image of his aunt stared right at him and said nothing. Dread set in and my uncle felt like he had done something very bad. He climbed underneath his blankets, waiting for it to go away. When he lowered the blankets from his eyes, nothing was there. He forgot about the water and just went to sleep. When my dad was about 24 or 25, my mom gave birth to me. After a few days of being home, my dad started to hear that I was struggling to breathe. He called the hospital and he had the phone up to my mouth. I was wheezing. The nurse said it was normal and to put me back to bed, that I'll be fine in the morning. My dad argued with her over the phone so we could see a doctor, but she refused. He picked me up and drove me over to the hospital. He ran up to the desk and the nurse kept telling him to take a seat and to wait like everyone else. A few moments later, a doctor came out from a set of doors behind the desk he noticed. Us and came over. He had one glance at my dad and his baby and started to call over emergency staff. My dad set me on the gurney and that's when he said I stopped breathing. The staff rushed me through the doors and my dad sat there in the waiting room. It turned out... The hospital had a huge pneumonia outbreak in the nursery. It said that a hundred or so babies had died. They tried to keep it out of the newspapers, but he news passed by word of mouth. For my memories of a past life, I think I was a spirit guide in some way or something. I knew my purpose was to watch other over living people. I just loved to help people and watch them as they grew up. I remember being able to move about in a blink of an eye from one person to the next. I would watch over them. There was a particular boy that I would watch. He was smart and I thought he was just a good person. I remember as I came back to him, he was in a bedroom at the top of the stairs. He was screaming and hitting the walls. You could hear the utter pain in his voice. His screams spoke volumes of pain. He was just a child and yet he was so broken angry and sad. Two of his brothers were in the hallway. One of them was completely quiet and seemed to have just felt nothing anymore. One of the other boys went into the bedroom and started to scream and cry as well. I wanted to help them, but their parents died. There was another guide who was there. He was an older man with a white beard. He kept me at bay as well. Seeing them in pain, so innocent, I could do nothing to help them. I couldn't touch them or hug them. They couldn't even see me. They didn't even know I was there. It made me feel misery and sadness and I was even angry that such a horrible event happened. I didn't understand. Why couldn't I have helped them? Why can't I help him or worse that I could because then I was supposed to? I wasn't even there. It not only broke him but it had broken me too. I loved everyone and this tore me apart inside. I think I was newer and the older man kept reminding me of something. We had to keep going. 
I had to move on to the others, but when I came back, the man who had already grown up, he placed his child into a gurney. I wonder if this pain brought me to him again. Why? Why the same man? Why? I didn't want his life to be miserable and painful. It wasn't fair. It didn't feel fair. It didn't feel right. I felt the rules and the balance and reason for the purpose over my head. I wasn't supposed to change what happened. It didn't feel right and in a selfish decision, I floated over the infant. When his child took her last breath and her heart stopped, that's when I entered her body. He had to have his daughter, at least. He had to have some happiness and joy in his life, even if it was just for a short while. I wasn't planning to stay. I remember growing up, I knew deep down that I wasn't supposed to stay. Later on, I told my uncle this. I wanted to see if it was even real or if it was all just a silly hogwash of my imagination as a kid. My uncle went quiet and looked down at his coffee cup in his hand. He said the night his parents died, my dad was the one who screamed and punched the walls. Their youngest brother and himself were the ones who stood in the hallway near the staircase and that their old other brother was the other one who sat down on the bed and screamed and cried along with my dad. He said it was strange to add the older man. He said my dad mentioned that the night before their parents died, his dad came up to the stairs to tell them to be quiet and go to bed. Before he came upstairs, he saw a man by the door, an older man with a beard. He covered his head with his blankets because of the brightness from his dad turning on the light. My dad said good night through his covers and his dad replied good night. When his dad turned off the lights, the man said, take a good look. This will be the last time you see them. My dad didn't have time to see his dad because he still had his covers over his head. Then his dad closed the door. His parents both died in a tragic car accident the next day. My uncle also opened up. He said that my dad was a powerful teacher in a past life and that he was a student. He said that my dad had more to teach him and said they would meet again in another life. But my dad walked away from his abilities after she remained. I guess it's for the best, but my uncle still waits for him. When I was 21 or 22, I had a near-death experience and had just gotten out of the hospital. Before that happened, I lived in an apartment where a lot of bad things, terrifying things would happen, and a lot of people would experience things there. So when I left the hospital, I decided to stay at my uncle's house for a week and recuperate before going back to the apartment. My uncle had a two-story house. The house had white trim and black window panes and a wraparound porch which was also painted black. I'd always gotten along with my uncle. I love him so much and he was more than happy to have me stay with him for the week. When I arrived, my uncle had a bedroom at the end of the hallway upstairs, all set up and ready to go. He was beaming with joy to have me there. He was just ecstatic. After showing me the room, he walked downstairs and I could hear him making a fresh pot of coffee, probably getting ready to watch his favorite TV shows. When I walked past the door into the room, I immediately felt stared at. And by stared at, I mean watched. I shrugged it off because, well, the apartment. I thought I was just so used to living in the apartment that I wasn't used to being in another house. I fluffed up the pillow and swept and mopped the floor, cleaned the bed and the chair, dusted the windows, and had gotten the bed all tucked in and ready for the night. When I was done, I walked downstairs and enjoyed some TV with my uncle. As the days passed each night, I still felt stared at. I felt like the room was staring at me, if that makes any sense. It had gotten to the point where when I would enter the room, I would whisper under my breath, I'm sorry, and I hope you don't mind if I stay for a little bit. I understand this is your room, and I'm going to try my best to be to polite to you. I thought it was all silly. But I was just silly and just still wasn't used to the room, but then... Some nights I would hear faint footsteps and creaking from around the room. I of course had to find something to explain it away. It's just an old house, that's all. It's just settling, no problem. Just going to sleep and just relaxing. The room had a chair on the other side. It sat in front of one of the two windows in the bedroom, beside the closet which had no door. One stormy night I laid in bed. 
It was a thunderstorm outside, and I could hear the pitter-patter of the rain tapping the window beside the bed. I thought this would help me sleep, and as I cozied up under the blankets and closed my eyes, a nightmare had begun. In my nightmare, I was laying in the bedroom under the blankets. There was a storm outside, and an eerie bluish light shone in through the windows. The thunderstorm was very active, and with each strike and shake of the room, it would briefly light up from the storm outside. I looked up from under the covers, and I looked around the room. The chair was beside the window, as always. In my dream, I had tried to fall back to sleep, and so I covered my head with my blanket. Then I noticed it. The sound of wood being drug across the floor with each crack of thunder. I threw the blanket from my face, and the chair had been drug closer to the bed. Bam! The room lit up again, and the chair came closer. Bam! Another crack of thunder, and as the light blinked away, it was even closer. I threw the blanket over my head, and I could hear the chair dragging across the wooden panels of the floor. Closer and closer and closer. My dream was over. When I woke up, I could see the bright sunshine through the blankets. So relieved, I pulled the blanket from the top of me when I noticed. The chair was right next to my bed, facing where my pillow was. I had simply said sorry to the bedroom and packed my things, as it was my last night there anyway. As I was leaving, I asked my uncle if anything strange happened in his house. He said no, nothing at all, and that it wasn't haunted. He asked why, but I didn't tell him. Later on, I asked my cousin, who slept in that room for a few months prior to my visit, if anything happened while he was in the room, particular about a nightmare in the chair. He was taken aback and he said, yes, I've had that same dream. He then said one night, he had woken up to see a pair of red glowing eyes staring back at him from right above him. Eyes without a body. So this is a very true, very scary story of true events which happened in an apartment I lived in with my boyfriend. When I was 19 or 20, my boyfriend and I rented an apartment together. Our particular unit of apartments, my dad found out in the end had a cult living there. The guy who actually had us sign the lease we made a comment about his cool looking rings. He then showed us his tattoos and he said, Satanism isn't a bad thing. It's about justice. And I think that's what people get wrong about it. You should come by one of the apartments to meet and greet sometime. He was really friendly and charismatic. He wasn't creepy and looked like anyone else you'd see on the street. He was someone that everyone liked and was friendly to everyone. He really cared about the residents and pretty much he was everyone's friend. And then said, yeah, maybe sometime. I wasn't planning to, but we were being nice because we didn't have any credit at 19 and just needed a place as our first apartment. He then showed us the apartment. They had popcorn and stuff on the counter as a cute little welcoming gift. He handed us the keys to it. As he opened the door to walk out, he turned to us and said, I think you're really going to enjoy this apartment. It's the one I lived in before I moved to a bigger unit. He smiled and then left. We settled in and had been building some furniture that we bought from Ikea in the living room. I noticed that each morning, the cross we bought at a prestigious cathedral kept ending up falling off the wall in the middle of the night. We weren't religious, but his parents lived in another country at the time and his dad used to bring them to a prestigious cathedral when he was a baby. I bought it for him as a gift so when he looked at it he would remember how much his parents loved him. I would just make excuses that the cross fell off because of the neighbour upstairs probably walking around at night. Or maybe the apartment settled in the night because it was older. When I was going to do the laundry in the apartment's shared laundry room I noticed a pentagram on the wall. I didn't really care what people's religion was, and I didn't really have a one anyway. So if people believed in something, it didn't really bother me. It didn't really scare me or anything. I had just gone on my way. Sometimes at night, I would think that I saw a shadow or a silhouette of a man. But when I would look over in the direction, nothing would be there. Sometimes the bedroom door would slowly open when my boyfriend wasn't home. I would hear small tapping or knocks, but I would brush it off as the apartment was old. As time went on, 
My boyfriend began to sit straight up in bed in the middle of the night. I would just gently tuck him back in. Later, he started to get up out of bed and walk into the living room and just stare at the wall. Each time, I would lead him back to his bed and tuck him in and kiss him goodnight and stay up for a few hours in case he had done it again. Then a few weeks later, I noticed something weird. Weirder than the other things. Something completely insane and, well, unexplainable. I had invited my uncles and my aunt and cousin over for a grill out. When I was walking out onto the concrete porch, I noticed the light switch in front of me clicking on and off to lights that didn't work anymore in the apartments. I mentioned it to them, but we all just ignored it. The shadow had gotten a bit worse, so as to speak. If you looked in the mirror in the bathroom, you could almost see a black cloud around your face, but again I made an excuse. Oh, the lights are just dim or something. One night, I was thirsty and had gone into the kitchen. I opened the refrigerator to grab some water, and when I turned around, all of the cabinets and drawers were open. This was new, and I thought Mark must have woken me up in the middle of the night again. Then my eyes adjusted to the dark, and I saw at the corner of my eye a person standing by the wall. I looked over completely frozen. I thought it was an intruder, and as my eyes adjusted, I noticed it looked just like me. It had my pajamas on, it had my body, my hair, but it was just, it was kind of slunked over. Then it moved and walked past me. As it walked past me, I tried to see the face to see if it was an intruder, but it didn't have one. It was just skin with no crevice for eyes or a nose or a mouth. I didn't believe my eyes. I didn't want to, because I thought if I believed them, it would give this thing power. As it walked past me, it went into the bedroom where my boyfriend slept and disappeared behind a corner. I went into the bedroom and looked into the closet. I looked under the bed. I checked the windows and doors to see if they were open. Nothing. I went to bed with a knife, but kept my eyes open so I could fight off an intruder if for some reason they came back. I let my boyfriend sleep. I didn't want it to affect him in case I was in fact going crazy. The next thing my boyfriend didn't want to go anywhere in the house. He needed me to go with him everywhere in the house. I asked him why and he went quiet and said, well, I don't know, I just like it when you're around. I looked him in the eye and said, is it because you see things in this house? His eyes went big and said, yes, I see shadows all over my face, but it's like it has thoughts. I told him it's okay, I see them too. I'll go with you whenever you need to go but you don't need to be scared of it. If you're scared of it or angry, it gives it power. I'm here, don't worry. The relief on his face was profound. The day it all became more real was when I woke up one morning. I was pretty happy because my boyfriend was making breakfast that day and I could smell bacon. I was chatting with him and we were smiling and joking. I leaned down and put my slippers on. When I had sat back up to talk to him, who was in the kitchen, I noticed a shadow without a body. It was almost as tall as the door. It had mass and volume, but I could also see through it. The only way I knew it was real was because my boyfriend was looking right at me through this thing. You could almost hear it thinking. It hated our love for each other. It hated our happiness. It hated good things. It felt like a sign for things to come. As time went on, my boyfriend ended up becoming aggressive and hateful. Anything could set him off. He tried everything to keep me in the house. My friends and family became too scared of the house to come and visit. I kept loving though. I kept loving everyone around me and at every turn I felt unloved and uncared for. Love was a huge part of my identity, with who I was even though I didn't have a religion. Love was something that I always believed could get you through every battle. The shadow thing, it kept showing up every day and every night, and more and more frequently. It covered the mirrors. My boyfriend's sleepwalking had gotten worse. Some nights I would wake up to find my boyfriend standing beside the bed, as if he was watching me sleeping, but his eyes were closed. Some nights I would find him in the restroom hunched on the ground, with his eyes closed and a razor was in his hand. And one night, 
I was reading on my phone and my boyfriend sat up in the bed. His head slowly started to turn to me and his eyes were open this time, but they were completely black. A few moments later, his eyes closed and he laid back down. A couple minutes passed and he rolled over and put an arm on my waist and said, I love you. The shadow would show up and tell me that I was torturing my boyfriend, that I was the reason why he was being tortured and that I should let it in. As the months passed, my boyfriend started to hate the apartment more, including me. He would yell at whatever it was in the apartment to leave and to come and get him instead of me. It only made things worse. My boyfriend started to go to work more often, taking on 19 to 22 hour shifts to get out of the house. When I was home alone, sometimes the cabinets and things would open on their own. Dishes would break. Glasses on the table would break on their own without moving. Shadows would show up and walk around me. I would hear my boyfriend calling out my name to come into the living room. Sometimes I would hear my own voice, but my boyfriend wasn't even home. When I was alone and taking a shower or a bath, the door would lock and I would be stuck inside with it. Only when I broke out in tears would it open again. I started to pray sometimes. I didn't really know how to do it, but sometimes I would get on my hands and knees and put my hands together like they did in the movies. I would ask for someone to please help me, to protect my boyfriend and my dog and my family. The shadow would appear and say, you're all alone. No one is coming for you. I'm the only one here. It would only make things even more worse. But still sometimes when I prayed, it felt like something good was there. I remember sometimes I would be locked in a room and I would just daydream my dad or my boyfriend or even a stranger bursting in and saying it's all going to be okay. But it never happened. It was just hope. The door would just unlock and I would be in the house with that thing. My boyfriend started to lock me in the bedroom and leave the house to go and gamble away the money in my account. This wasn't him. He was someone that he wasn't anymore. There came a time where my boyfriend had finished dragging me around the house and when I looked at him, in that moment I knew he lost the battle and that I lost him. I lost the reason to keep on fighting it. My boyfriend already lost. I was alone and laying on the bed one night. I remember I was tired from fighting this thing. The shadow thing showed up beside the bed and said, I'm your only friend. I'm the only one who has been here with you. Let me in and I'll make this all go away. Let me in. I didn't even have enough energy to listen to it. I don't care anymore. It would just keep saying, let me in and you don't have to fight like this anymore. You're selfish. You're making them suffer. If you let me in, he will be freed. And then one day, after about a year of this being continual, I laid in the bedroom alone and unable to get out, I said, okay, I finally gave in. I lost everything. It had gotten really bad. My personality changed and all of a sudden, my boyfriend and I began physically fighting and we had inhuman strength. It's like the thing was trying to get rid of all love and humanity that we had left. It kept saying, look at them. Why do you love them? They are liars and evil. But I never stopped loving. I was still in there. If I bumped into someone or shook their hand, I saw their deepest regrets and fears. I saw every time they lived, every time they hurt someone. And if I brought it up, they didn't know how I knew and they definitely didn't want anyone else to know. I remember one time I heard myself tell someone that they could never forgive themselves and that they will be going to hell and that I'll meet them there, that I'll drag them to hell. I saw things before they happened. I knew people's names from across the room. I remember one time I had gotten upset with someone for some reason. I hated them and I had a deep dark desire to ruin their lives. I had gotten news that they were moving to California. Then I heard its voice say, the hills shall burn in hellfire. A few weeks passed and I saw on the news that wildfires started to spring up in California. Their apartment was one of the first places to burn down in the fire. There was another person who for some reason I was upset with. I hated them as well for absolutely no reason. It said, the mountain shall fall, fire will rain down. And a little bit later, 
a volcano erupted in Hawaii, where they were staying. When I saw the news, I said that was never something I would have ever wanted, and it became angry. Don't you see this was for you? I recall him saying. I recall him being upset that I didn't appreciate it. I remember just knowing that I would never hate or hurt someone. It was like it would manipulate and manifest emotions and act like it was me, to show that we were different. The battle was to hold onto the good inside, to hold onto me. Things became more and more worse as time went on. One time, I had just gotten really upset with my boyfriend out of the blue and wanted him to die. Something from the kitchen flew across the room and hit the wall behind him. It just, it wasn't good. The thing inside had fun and delight in causing inner turmoil. And as I learned more about this thing, the more I knew I had to keep loving and caring. There was me and there was this thing and we both could control my body. It became me. It was absolutely an insane experience and an awful experience. You don't know what it's like to have something else living in your body until you do. It's not worth it to give up. And I fought it in the end. I fought it and it had a hard time holding on. It would cause physical illness. It would make me throw up food for days and days and days if I felt love and care for someone. If I stopped it from looking into them, it was pure evil. It kept me aware of what it was doing while inside. It wanted me to see and feel the delight that it had when it terrified people with knowledge a human couldn't have been able to know about other people. It thought it was showing me how much stronger it was than what these people believed in. It tried to make me believe that this was more powerful than the immense amount of love I felt for people and even strangers. Sometimes my boyfriend and I would wake up in the middle of the night and it would be raining in the bedroom with thunder inside of our house. It was crazy. It smelled like sulfur and I thought that it was a dream. But I turned to my boyfriend and he was seeing it all too. You could see the utter terror and disbelief in his eyes and I can't imagine to look that he saw on mine. We ran around the house. I grabbed our dog and opened the front door. The moment I stood in the hallway of the apartment, it was quiet. No thunder. I called out to see if everyone was okay. There wasn't any smoke and no one answered. And I turned around and in my apartment it was still raining and there was still thunder. But I couldn't hear it from the outside of my apartment. I went inside the apartment and as soon as it started, it stopped. The carpet was dry. The walls were dry, everything was dry, like nothing ever happened. My boyfriend and I looked at each other and went back to bed completely dazed. I still believe it was just a vivid dream, until we fell asleep and woke up the next morning still dazed. That's when we actually had to come to terms that it was real and that it actually happened. My dad texted me after weeks of no contact out of the blue. He told me that we had to get out of that apartment. I didn't even tell him what had happened. That's when we decided that we couldn't fight this alone and went to the cathedral on the hill for help. When we arrived, I felt panic set in. It felt like a gut-wrenching feeling that I had to leave, that I had to get out of there and I felt an immense hate for everyone there. The thing inside of me didn't want to be there and resented it. I don't know what my boyfriend felt, but he said he saw my face change into someone else. We walked up the steps and went to the cathedral for the first time for help. There was a church surface going on and all that I could hear was the sound of a thousand snakes. I couldn't hear them talking. I just heard a voice saying cockroaches, these motherfucking cockroaches. I forced myself and whatever that thing was to sit there until the end. When the service was over, I approached what I thought was a priest. I asked him if I could get some help from them. I told them about the shadow we saw in the apartment and the cross falling off the wall and my sister's necklace bracing. He was just angry. My boyfriend says the priest looked absolutely uncomfortable and pissed off at me. The whole time he was glaring at me while I talked to him. He interrupted me and said, seeing ghosts is a sin. We can't help you. He left it at that and even as I tried to quietly ask, almost beg for help, he didn't reply or even look at me. My boyfriend and I had to simply walk away. 
There was a boy who was sitting on a bench next to where I spoke to the priest. I went over to him and sat down next to him. I said, your mom is in heaven. She said to not be sad and that it's okay. She wants to visit you sometimes. The little boy looked up at me and said his mom died two weeks ago. He held my hand and thanked me and I stood up. I looked over at the priest and he was absolutely pissed, glaring at me. I walked out without any help for what was happening. I remember while I was growing up, there was a man who would stand near me at times. Actually, he wasn't a man or woman or a child. He had an appearance that didn't really identify him as either, but I just called him a he. I don't remember when he first started showing up. No one else could see him. I think maybe my uncle saw him once, but no one believed him and I never spoke up. But I think what he was, the more the malicious one, who also wore a hat, but he had a long coat on. If no one believed him, why would they have believed me? He was in an almost all black outfit and he had a bowler hat on. He didn't have a face. His skin was pitch black. His face, he was just swirling matter like a galaxy. Every so often, he would just show up. I remember for a while that he would help me with dealing with ghosts and things. He would remind me not to tell anyone about them. He said that they wouldn't understand. He would tell me which ones were good and which ones were bad. I think he was a guide or something similar, but I thought of him as a good friend. He would help me draw sometimes, and sometimes when I would walk to school, he would stand beside the sidewalk before I entered school. For his ability, he was able to see into the future and the past. He was able to speak through dreams, and he would warn me if something was going to happen. He showed me what it looked like while he was traveling. For some planes, the time would move backwards, but each one was like a never ending spiral thread. Each one interconnected and all of them moved in a wave. When they would move and space opened in the threads, we could see what would happen in the future of, or travel to another plane. Where he was from was dark, like a darker world that mimicked ours, but it wasn't quite right. He said that's where the shadows come from. I remember during my senior year of high school, I was sitting in class. It was a world philosophies class and I remember my teacher said that some people believe that people have abilities. He started to talk about physics and things and then he asked if anyone had any unexplainable experiences. I remember all of our desks were in a circle and a few of the kids raised their hands and talked about the times they played with Ouija boards and stuff. More and more of them were sharing their own experiences. Then I felt the words get up. I was still shy, so I stayed seated. As the circle came closer and closer to me and everyone shared what they wanted to, my teacher asked, anyone else? My friend was sitting next to me and after she was done sharing, she nudged me with her shoulder and asked if I had anything to share since everyone else did. It was quiet and we stayed seated. The students were looking at each other. My friend showed up and said, stand up. I stood up and my teacher asked me if I had anything to share. I was really nervous and was scared of public speaking. Reluctantly, I said yes. I mentioned that sometimes I can see things before they happen. The other kids didn't seem to judge me at all and seemed pretty interested in it, which was very, very surprising to me. I think because they had already opened up, it was sort of okay to talk about these things during that class period. After I told them about what he said time and space look like, I said, he can tell me things that are going to happen before they even happen. One of the kids told me to tell them something. Nervously, I said, okay, I can try. I stood there, scared that maybe that time my friend would show nothing at all and that I would have ended up embarrassed and looking stupid but it was the end of my senior year and I wasn't gonna see them again. Then my friend began to show me images. He showed a girl's long brown hair draped over the front of a car's hood. He showed that the girl was in the same classroom, that she would be an honor student in her senior year, and that she would be given the speech for her graduation. He showed me kids inside of a vehicle. They were all talking and smiling. 
but I could only see their smiles and her long brown hair, which was tied up, I think. It was dark outside the car windows. I could hear their muffled voices, and then the view turned to the windshield. A few moments later, a tree appeared in the headlights. It cut her hair onto the hood of a car. I never saw her face. Nothing that could identify her other than her long brown hair. The only thing I really knew was that she was in the same class that day. When the vision was done, I hesitantly looked around the class. I didn't want to tell them, but I thought maybe when they grew up, they would believe in this kind of stuff if I did say something. I also felt that maybe I could save her before it happened. I said that there was a girl in the class and that this girl would die before her graduation. She has long brown hair. Her car will end up hitting a tree. She won't make it. I glanced over at one of the girls across the room for a second and then continued to look around the class trying to figure out who it was as I sat back down. The kids were all surprised and intrigued. I think some of the girls were scared. My teacher looked at the drawing on the board that I made of the map and he said that was another philosopher's idea. And he said that will be our homework for tomorrow. For months, I was trying to find out who the girl was, but I didn't find out in time. The girl I glanced at is the girl who died. I didn't speak to my friend again after she died. I didn't find her in time and I felt guilty about it. I didn't understand why he didn't help me tell her or save her. I don't think I was allowed to. He would come around. I didn't talk to him anymore. I was five or six years old. One day, my sister and I went to a birthday party at one of her friend's houses. There was a built-in pool in their backyard. A few of the kids were playing and some of the kids convinced me to swim in the shallow end with them. Some of the parents were around chatting and occasionally watching the kids play before they started chatting again. It made me feel safer, so I said yes. Also, my sister hated it whenever my parents made me come with. I didn't want to ruin the party for her, plus I didn't know anyone too well, so it would be less awkward. I didn't know how to swim, but it was pretty shallow and I was able to stand up in it. Eventually, while we were playing, some of them had gotten out of the pool and I didn't notice. As I was kind of crudely swimming about, occasionally bouncing one of my legs at the bottom of the pool so I could move around, I went to put my feet down onto the floor, but it was tilted just a little bit. My heart sank and I knew I was in trouble, but it was too late. I was on my tippy toes at that point and the tilt from the bottom of the pool managed to push me into the deep end. I tried to call out for help, but the water filled my mouth. So I gave up on that and just tried my best to breathe. As I sank down, I reached the bottom and I would push off as hard as I could so I could get some air again. And I tried to get enough to float because that's all I knew. But each time I only had a second to breathe again and it only got shorter and shorter. Each time losing a little bit more air in my lungs and buoyancy. I remember that after a few times of doing this again, when I reached the bottom to kick off midway into reaching the water level, I felt something grab my ankles. It was pretty tight. I kept flapping my legs to try and swim up, but I wasn't going anywhere. I thought it was just another one of the kids who was trying to play and didn't know I was scared and needed help. I saw the water level above me and the people's reflections rippling above the water surface. And I could hear the muffled sounds of the party above. I remember thinking, if only they could hear me. If only they knew I was underwater, then this all would have been over already. I had to keep my eyes open so I could know when I reached the air again, but the chlorine kept burning my eyes as I held them open. I looked down below me to look at the kid. I thought if he saw my face, he would know I couldn't swim, that it wasn't playing. But when I looked down, it wasn't a kid at all. It was a thin shadow. It had extremely thin arms and there had been claws at the end of its fingers. Upon its face was an unnatural smile, a grin as it mocked me as I struggled to swim up for air, as if it mocked what could have been the last moments of my life. I remember at that moment how hard I wanted to scream, but I knew that no one would hear me. But I screamed anyway. I couldn't help it and I ended up inhaling. 
The water felt so strange because I didn't breathe in air, it was just liquid. I remember the feeling of knowing I only had a few seconds left and just wishing that someone could hear me. I think I remember hearing a splash above me. It was my older sister. She jumped into the water and she knew how to swim. I blacked out shortly after that. I don't know what happened really. I just remember being on the concrete at the edge of the pool. My sister always says that she was the one who swam and took me out of the pool. She saw that I was having problems and she waited for an adult to see it, but they never noticed. After I didn't come back up, she jumped in and took me to the edge where an adult helped pull us out. Which is amazing because that makes her only six or seven then. But I'm still scared of swimming in deep water because I never know what could be underneath. When I was a kid, from 3 to 12 years old, I would often draw. I always enjoyed drawing as I continued to grow. My dad and my uncles had always loved these drawings, until they noticed something peculiar with each one. I remember one afternoon when I was in elementary school, I was sitting at my desk in class, which was situated next to a large window, overlooking the playground. I sharpened my yellow lead pencil and started to draw on the back of my schoolwork. And I remember thinking how my dad would love this drawing. I think that day we had a substitute teacher. She noticed and called my dad to tell him that I shouldn't be drawing on the back of my schoolwork. My dad pretended to be slightly upset, but when we had gotten home, my dad put the picture onto our refrigerator and said it was a really nice drawing. Being a little kid, I was pretty proud of myself. I can recall one time in the living room when my dad was having a quiet, almost whispered conversation with two of my uncles. He mentioned that while at school, I drew a picture in class. He took out the picture and said, how did she know what we were talking about? My uncles looked at the picture for a moment and one said, that's kind of neat. It's kind of like her other ones. I don't remember all of the conversation. It became a sort of faded memory. Later on, my dad told me when I grew up a little bit that as a kid, I would draw pictures of their exact conversations from that day. My dad and my uncles would have paranormal experiences. Without mentioning them prior to their conversations and while I was at school as unaware, I would draw their experiences in detail. So this happened a few years ago in my college dorm room. I had the whole room to myself and it was quite nice to get alone time after a long day. This particular room I've had a few strange experiences in. From lost time to a rat manifesting itself from nowhere to an odd bird chirping outside my window at night only to find nothing there after opening the curtains. Because of this incident I remember it was a weekend and I slept in for a few hours. Instead of being awoken naturally I awoke to sleep paralysis. I was on my belly, head to the side, and I felt a force keeping me in bed. Not really pushing me down, I just felt like I was glued to the bed. And then I heard a female voice whisper to me in a Russian East European accent. If you don't wake up now, you'll die here. I, left, I felt my blood turn cold, and I immediately jumped away from the bed. The voice sounded so incredibly real, that I genuinely still believe there was someone in my room. I've had sleep paralysis before and it all felt sort of fake. Like part of me knew it's not real, but this felt so real and so true. I genuinely felt like I was going to die. A little backstory of who Chris and Pat are. Chris is my childhood best friend that passed away from cancer at the young age of 41, three years ago. Pat's my friend and also my childhood sweetheart. He died from a motorcycle accident at the age of 42, one year after Chris. And it's been two years since his death. This is the journal entry. Even though I'm an atheist, I do entertain the idea ever so often of a higher power. If there is one, my money is on aliens and we're in an ant farm their pots or experiments if you will. I also entertain the thought of ghosts and spirits, but deep down I know it's bullshit. Or so I thought. I still kind of do, but what are the fucking odds of this happening? 
You're going to think I'm loony, but I talk to myself all the time. I like to say a sentence out loud in the middle of a thought. Example, thought of Ron the other day, friends with his sister still, so I thought of her and it dominoed to him. I thought how I hoped his sorry narcissistic ass dies alone. This was a thought in my head. Then out loud I said, no, I hope he has a great life. He's just a fucking asshole. I'm weird, lol. So, I'm driving to work. A song comes on that reminds me of Pat. I feel him, but I know it's all in my head. Then I do this. Pat, if you're here, play the next song. Slayer. Yeah, play Slayer. I don't care which song. I laugh. Ooh, you too, Chris. You play Pantera. You got that, guys? Chris, you have Pantera and Patrick. You have Slayer. Any song, just the band. Maybe that's how you guys can show me you are here. And that when I feel you, it's you and I'm not crazy. Then I remember that I have heard or read some time in my life that you have to say their full names. So I pretty much repeated what I said above, but called out their full names instead of just saying Pat or Chris. Ending the sentence after saying with girl, you have a long ass name. I laughed again. The song that was on finishes and Pantera fucking comes on. Okay, that's a huge coincidence. But I also realized the chances of that happening, although small, probably not unheard of. Nevertheless, I get upset and almost start crying. I then say to Chris, Gil, stop. I put mascara on today. By this time, I'm parked in the garage at my work. I'm trying to compose myself and I'm still shocked that it happened. I decided to grab my phone and take a snapshot of the song playing. I was so wrapped up in my emotions that I didn't realize the song had changed. It was playing Slayer. I know that this sounds like a fabricated story, but I swear on everything that I love, it's not. Mind you, I was on an Amazon Prime station called My Likes and More. It wasn't even my music library. What's the likelihood of that happening, in all honesty? Pretty damn slim, right? Shortly after writing this, I decided to look at the playlist. I can't recall the last time I've ever liked a song on Amazon, because usually when my Bluetooth gets picked up by my vehicle, it just plays what it wants and I roll with it, or just forward it until it plays something I like or I'm in the mood for. That being said, there are 20 songs in that playlist. This has really rocked my world. I don't know what to think. What's the likelihood of this happening? Also, the Pantera song isn't even on that playlist. Thoughts? Opinions? 